Jesus was forsaken So I will never be His grace is my salvation The gift of God The work of Calvary It is done It is finished Christ has won, he is risen, grace is here, love has triumphed over death forever. The cross needs no addition. His mercy is complete. His love is not in question. The Son of God has spoken over me. It is done. It is finished. Christ has won. He is risen. Hey, good evening, friends and family, Orchard Hill. Um, it is good just to be together again in this medium. And I have the privilege tonight of talking with you about Psalm 32. And this is actually a really different psalm than most of the psalms that we've been in so far, because this is what's known as a psalm of confession. We have here David confessing his sin. And it starts off saying, a mascal of David, that's the title, and a mascal was something that was uh, really uh, meant to be something that you ponder and think through and then act with prudence. And so this is, is intended to be his statement of saying, as I ponder, as I think, this is something that I've really come to believe. 
And most commentators think that this was one of the Psalms that he wrote after this whole incident with Bathsheba, which was 2 Samuel 11, where he had had uh, an affair and then arranged to have Bathsheba's husband, his life taken from him, uh, not his high point. And yet this was a man who the Bible says had a heart after God. And so this is, this is what he, he does. And he comes and, and says, blessed, this is verse one, is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. Now, on the weekends, we've been working our way through Joel that really points to the importance of turning to God, returning to God, repenting. And so this psalm, in a way, just goes perfectly with that because this psalm is a psalm of repentance. But the first thing we need to do is understand what sin is and then what sin does in order to know how we should respond. So, so first, we see what sin is. And there's three words used here for sin. If you've been around Orchard Hill, you've probably heard me talk about the, this and this, this little bit that I'm about to do. But the, the, the words are sin, uh, which is in the second phrase here. And it's the word shatak. Then there's transgression, which is the word pesha in Hebrew. And then there's the word iniquity, which is the word avon in, uh, in Hebrew. And here's what they, they all mean, the shade of meaning. Sin, uh, in this translation, shatak means to miss the mark. Transgression or pesha means to rebel willfully, to choose not to obey. So, so missing the mark means, means I, I had good intentions. I just didn't do what was probably best. Uh, whereas pesha means I chose not to. And avon or iniquity means to be twisted, perverted, to take something that's good and beautiful and bend it and twist it and make it not useful, not beautiful. Uh, the, the way that I've thought of explaining this uh, came from a few years ago. We have uh, four young men living with us right now. Uh, but when my four sons were all home, there would always be this battle over the milk. And, and the battle would be this. One kid would go in and drink the milk, and then he would put the, the milk back with very little milk left in the bottom, just enough that he didn't feel like he had to go out to the outer refrigerator and bring in a new gallon. This is totally a first world problem. I'm aware of that. But, but my kids would, would think, I'm not going to walk all the way to the garage refrigerator and have to replace it. So I'm going to leave just a little bit of milk in here. And what would happen is they would start to gripe at each other. As soon as they'd go in to get milk, they'd be like, who left the milk like this? And what they were doing is they were pointing out a uh, shatak, uh, a missing of the mark, saying, that's just kind of, you know, cheap. Well, then what would happen is, is some of them would, would say, okay, I'm going to rebel. And they would just finish off the milk, throw the carton out and not replace it and be like, what are you going to do to me? That's pesha. Or that is transgression. But then one of them decided that he was going to have, you know, his last revenge. And so what he did is he got the milk drunk down pretty far, and then he went and took water and put it in there. So it still looked like milk, but it was half and half. So, you know, if you talk about 1%, 2%, this was like 0.1% milk. And, uh, and what he did is he waited then until one of his brothers went to get it, who then took it, drank it, and was like, this is awful. And what he did was iniquity, avon in this sense. Now, why do I just say what sin is? A lot of times what we do is we think that sin is simply just disobedience. And sin is that, but it's also a missing of the mark, a willfulness, but, but it can be twisting what is good. It can be taking what God wants for us and living in a way that, that we twist that in such a way that, that we no longer have the good of what was intended for something. And then we see what sin does, verses three and four. It says, for when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up by the heat as by the heat of summer. And so he talks here about his bones wasting away, which is talking about an internal or structural issue. He talks about groaning, which becomes more obvious to people, but, but is an obvious internal pain. And then about his strength being taken away. And here's what, what unconfessed sin does in our lives is it ultimately makes us unstable. It takes away our strength and it produces an inward pain. Uh, for example, if you find yourself holding a grudge against somebody, you may think that's not that big of a deal. Like, oh, well, 
But what happens is soon that grudge begins to hold you and you will see yourself beginning to all of a sudden not be stable around that person because you won't be able to take in any information about what that person has done that is good or see that person in a good light. Or you'll, you'll find yourself in a place where all of a sudden your strength starts to ebb away because you've invested so much in the grudge. In other words, sin is devastating. But what we see here, again, is that in the verses that follow, we see kind of what we can do. And this is verse five to the end. The first thing is to confess, verses five through seven. I acknowledge my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord for you forgave my, the iniquity of my sin. Now notice again there, all the words for sin are utilized. But what he's doing here is he's saying in essence, I am going to no longer cover my sin. I'm going to acknowledge it. I'm going to speak about it very plainly. One of the things I've said in this Joel series uh, that I've said before, but uh, you know, self-righteousness really keeps us from repentance. And if you aren't the worst sinner you know, you probably don't know yourself very well. If you look at other people and say, that person needs to repent, but you don't see your own need to repent, what's happened is you've allowed judgment to go into your soul in such a way that you're covering your own sin. I'm not saying that there's never a time to look at somebody else and say, that seems out of line. That seems like a Pesha or a, you know, Avon or a Shatak to me. What, what I'm saying is that, is that the the essence of missing our chance to repent is an unwillingness to acknowledge our sin or a desire to cover our sin. Because once we do that, it says that God forgives or that word can mean carries or bears our sin. And then verse six and seven follow up with that same idea. And then we see this, uh, verse is eight and following. It says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or mule without understanding which must be curbed with a bit and bridle or it will not stay near you. And I think that's talking about compliance. So if we have first confession, then we have compliance uh, because it's talking about and comparing us to a horse or a mule saying, don't be like a horse or mule who only obeys when it's forced, but instead let it be something that comes out of the heart. In fact, I would say without compliance, you have to at least ask the question, has there really been confession? Now that doesn't mean perfect compliance, because again, the scripture is very clear that none of us complies completely on an everyday basis for everything. But, but what it means is that we don't simply say, well, I confess and I still intend to go do whatever it was that I did again. But I at least in that moment say, God, I am being completely compliant to what you want. And then at the very end, we see the celebration. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but the steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright of heart. I love where this ends because when you and I come to a point of actually confessing our sin and resolving that we will let God be God of our lives, it will lead to joy. It will lead to celebration. Um, and what keeps us from celebration is resisting the notion of repenting or saying, I was wrong in this area. And so the Psalm just very simply in this instant isn't dealing with comfort in our trouble or adversity. It is calling us to say, it is good to bring your sin to God because that is where you will find ultimate deliverance. So let's just take a moment and pray together. And this is from the Book of Common Prayer. Um, and this is a well-known prayer of confession. It's something that we often do in our chapel liturgical service. Um, so just pray this with me. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against thee in thought, in word, and in deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved thee with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of thy son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in thy will and walk in thy ways. To the glory of thy name, amen. And just before we close, let me just, just encourage you 
before you leave this this time of thought, you know, maybe you click offline here and, uh, you know, just take a moment and say, God, I confess to you the areas I've sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Those three categories, what thoughts, what words, what deeds do you want to bring before God and say, God, in what I've done and left undone, here is where I need to bring my sin to you once again. Thanks for joining us here this evening. Have a great night.